Yes. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Up in Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Through storytelling and conversational interviews, this weekly radio show offers listeners firsthand insight in starting and running a business, the ups and downs of risk taking, and the commonalities of successful people. Connect with Carrie through her candid, often funny, and informative weekly blog, where you'll read and comment on life as wife, mother, daughter, and entrepreneur. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Thank you, Jason. Like Jason said, I'm Carrie McCoy, and it's time for me to get up in your business. Before we start, I want to introduce my co-host, who you just heard from, Jason Malik from Arise Studio in Conway, Arkansas. Say hello, Jason. Hi, Carrie. So that opening is recorded. Mm-hmm. So my people watching on Facebook can't hear that. Mm, no. You may have to start so. reading that live. He may have to start doing that live. <laughs> 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 really? So anyway, if right now you're sitting at your computer, you might want to watch us live on Facebook, although you can't really hear the opening that you just heard off your own Facebook. Uh, but it's kind of fun to see what goes on behind the scenes at the flagandbanner.com Facebook page. And if for any uh, and if for some reason you miss any part of today's show or want to hear it again, or if you want to share it, there's a way. And Jason is going to tell you how, but you people on Facebook can't hear it. Listen to all UIYB past and present interviews by going to flagandbanner.com and clicking on radio show. There you may join our email list or like us on Facebook, thus getting a reminder notification of the day of the show and a sneak peek of that day's guest. And if you'd like to be an underwriter of any UIYB shows, send an email to marketing at flagandbanner.com. That's marketing at flagandbanner.com. Back to you, Carrie. Thank you. Uh, if you are watching on Facebook, you're seeing us <laughs> in here because Jason's going, you told me not to play that on there. And I'm like, oh, I did. I didn't remember doing that. But anyway, if you're tuning into this broadcast for the first time, welcome. And if you're not and you're a, retur- you're, and if you're a returning fan, you probably know this next part by heart. But at the risk of being boring, we must repeat ourselves for the newcomers. And besides that, it gives my guest a chance to settle into their seat. Not that my guest needs to. He's all settled in and relaxed. This show, Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, began as a platform for me, a small business owner and a guest, to pay forward our experiential knowledge in a conversational way. Originally, my team and I thought it would speak to entrepreneurs and want to be entrepreneurs. But it seems to have a wider audience appeal because, after all, who is inspired by everyday people's American-made stories, to see people in their totality is humanizing. We all thirst to connect and make sense of an overcomplicated world. And on this show, we had the luxury of time to go deeper than a mere soundbite or headline. And my favorite part of this show is we always learn something. It's no secret that successful people work hard, but other common traits found in many of my guests are the heart of a teacher, belief in a higher power, and creativity because business in of itself is creative. My guest today may look like a mountain man. He's nodding. And in fact, he is, but he's much more. He is a Little Rock, he is Little Rock, Arkansans creative chef, Matt Bell, owner and operator of the sophisticated yet unpretentious bistro South on Main, located at none other than South on Main. Born in Missoula, Montana, Schooled at, Le, uh, let's see, Le, Le Cordon Bleu. Le Cordon Bleu. Le Cordon Bleu Culinary Arts in Austin, Texas. Mm-hmm. This creative chef fell in love with an Arkansan woman and lucky for us, followed his heart and her home to the capital city where he landed a job at Capitol Hotel's fine dining establishment. After a four-year stint as sous chef at said restaurant, Matt, along with his wife, Amy Kelly Bell, her aunt, the actress Mary Steenburgen, and her husband, actor Ted Danson, collaborated with Oxford American Magazine and then publisher Warwick Saban to open South on Main Restaurant in the summer of 2013. That's a lot of name dropping right there. Today, we're going to talk about the business of opening and running a restaurant, about life as a professional chef, what it's like to have celebrity in-laws who give you a shout out on the Jimmy Fallon late night talk show. <laughs> 
He's no response from him. <laughs> and how the Oxford American Magazine's performing arts stage came to be the centerpiece of Chef Bell's restaurant, South on Main. It is a pleasure to welcome to the table the creative, hardworking. Are you shy? No. Just quiet, thoughtful. You are thoughtful. very thoughtful. You very are, thoughtful. Uh huh. Chef Matt Bell. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. It was, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, you are comfortable here. Yeah. I was at the hotel five years. I just want to clarify oh, really? that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, very mm-hmm. interesting. You know, I get all my information from online. Mm. Mm-mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't believe, do it. Don't do it. Don't believe anything you see online. Well, there's a perfect example. <laughs> Please be very skeptical. So right. <laughs> yep. uh, for our listeners who cannot see you, if you're on Facebook, you can see us. You look like a mountain man. Yeah, I come by that pretty honestly, I think. We were talking about uh, right before the show that if you've had a drink and you're sitting around writing the script Mountain Man in Montana, that... Matt Montana kind of elides into looking like Mountain Man after a drink or two. And mm-hmm. I like to drink what you're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought we were a few weeks away from medical marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Carrie might have found some already. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I did look at your name and was like, the more I talked to Mountain Man and I talked to Montana, I thought, man, those really go together. Uh, and you are from Montana. Did you grow up a grow up hunting fishing oh yeah yeah um i don't even if you grew up in a city which i didn't i don't i don't think those are i don't think those are avoidable growing up in montana we um i think last census just broke a million people in montana the whole state the whole state um so i think wyoming is less population dense but just barely i think we're under one person per mile per square mile in montana did you grow up eating buffalo and Uh, bear uh not buffalo uh i was actually raised a vegetarian uh, in montana yeah that always surprises people uh my dad was uh probably pushed for it more than my mom i think um because she did the cooking so she probably didn't (laughs) would have been easier on her but uh we um Let's see, I was born in 1978, and so we didn't actually probably start eating meat till I was about four or five years old, and it was either uh, what my dad had hunted, so deer, elk, and then um, we had bought the the first house my parents bought. Uh, I want to say they paid like $19,000 for it or something. Beautiful farmhouse on like three and a half acres. Um, It... uh, was part of a, a an, an original farm. Um, it was like a a family uh, house that was kind of on the outskirt of the farm. So it housed the uh, what they call the finishing lot. So once my dad, uh, once we bought it, the the farmer, um, the rancher, I should say, he. Um, offered to rent the finishing lot from us so he could still use the finishing lot. What's finishing lot mean? Uh, that's where they go before they meet their maker, as oh, they say. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, okay. Finish, yeah. finish them off. Okay, go ahead. Well, yeah, there's some there's some uh, specific feeding and stuff they do in the finishing lot. It's, it's, uh, it, it, they're there for, for a couple of weeks before they, they get slaughtered. So, uh, we, in exchange for him using the finishing lot, we got a side of beef. So my dad could see where the cows were. He knew the rancher, he knew what they were eating, what kind of, uh, what kind of antibiotics they were getting or lack thereof. And so at that point, my dad figured that was, that beef was safe. So we'd get a side of beef. I think it was every couple months. Um, so that was really the first, my first experience as a kid with meat was whatever, uh, the cow was out there. And then a couple weeks later we had him. So I remember getting up real early as a kid and uh, my bedroom was upstairs in this farmhouse and, you could go out some kind of French doors onto this porch and uh, you'd look across kind of our driveway to the finishing lot. And if you got up early enough, you could see the guy come and he would uh, 
harvest the cow, I guess is, that's the nice way to put it. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think that al- although I was raised a vegetarian, I really try and stay connected to my food. That's just how I was, uh, how I was raised. We gardened in the two and a half months. You can plant stuff in Montana and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're, really we were, we're eating, um, you know, uh, mostly economic reasons, but also for, for envi- environmental reasons, we were, we were eating pretty much only what we, what we produce. So. Your family, your dad sounds really interesting. Uh, yeah. He He's was, a Southerner, isn't he? Uh, he was born in Savannah, Georgia, um, but, uh, spent most of his childhood in California and, uh, my, Is he a hippie? Oh yeah, definitely. Got most it. definitely. My parents lived, uh, they met in a tiny town in Northern California called Quincy, which is about 70 miles, um, west of Reno, Nevada and about 60 miles east of Chico in the heart of the, uh, Sierra Nevadas. And, uh, they moved there. I get, well, my dad came back from Vietnam to there. So that was, uh, I, th- I believe 74, he came back there and, um, they met and then they decided that Northern California was just too crowded for them oh. or at least for him. I don't, my mom grew up in Sacramento, so I think she would have been happy staying close to a city, but, uh, they decided that, uh, they were going to move to Alaska and oh, wow. my dad was uh, doing road surveying at the time. So he, uh, got on with the crews that were, uh, at the time doing the Alcan highway, which was the first highway that could get you from North America all the way to Alaska, like mm-hmm. a, like one main route rather than all of kind of the community roads you had to take. So they, um, got on a ferry in Seattle, the Malaspina, which still, uh, is a ferry up there and, uh, went to Anchorage and, uh, that was like beginning of the summer. And then, uh, come winter, my mom was pregnant with me and she, uh, was That's about all there is to do in Alaska. Uh, uh yeah, well, <laughs> I, I did some research that that must've happened before Alaska, oh, okay. um, <laughs> but they, uh, my mom, they lived in a, a small kind of cabin outside of town. And, uh, my mom went to go to work one day, uh, about seven months pregnant with me and there was a moose that prevented her from getting to her car and uh moose are super aggressive nobody yeah. realizes that mm-hmm. um so that uh, mixed with the cold and the winter and being a california girl she was like uh, i gotta get out of here so they decided to move to stevensville montana <laughs> in uh in the winter of of 77 78 and uh it just happened to be one of the worst winners on record in montana so she thought she was getting away from it right you know let's go way south and uh <laughs> let's go to the north way south i guess and uh so they they bought that they lived in a house just down the road from the house we ended up buying uh and uh your mother's a good 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 person she's a good sport yeah. she's a good sport yeah. <laughs> she snowbirds now which means when yeah. the snow flies in montana she gets the heck out of there and goes to arizona so <laughs> she's she's figured it out your for dad's herself. still alive no he passed actually when i was real young so she remarried uh, i never remarried no but she stayed well, in Montana. No, she did remarry, but not not when I was ever in school. She stayed in Montana, though. She did. She did. And you uh, got we brothers and sisters. I got one sister. She's a school teacher in um, Montana. In Montana, in a little town just outside of Missoula, um, call it, it'd kind of be like Jacksonville to North Little Rock, um, much smaller town, but kind of that proximity. You don't really know you're in another town, but did you grow up a eating uh, e- eating a southern food since your dad was kind of a southerner? Yeah, we were the only. I, I I'm the only kid I know um, in Montana that ever knew what grits were. Mm. And granted, all you could ever buy was instant grits. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think I had a single friend that ever appreciated that my mom made those for breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) I thought it was was pretty weird. They were like, this is some weird oatmeal. (laughs) Yeah, they're like, is this malt oatmeal? No, man, it's grits. Malt Mm -hmm. oatmeal. I love that stuff. Let's let's talk about you becoming a chef. Is it because you grew up on the land that you wanted to be a chef? Did you always know you wanted to be a chef? You know, I, I think that, that, you know, currently things are changing a little bit as far as how we, um, look at continued education after high school. Uh, you know, in 1997, when I was graduating, you know, 95, 96, 97, when I'm getting ready to look at colleges or secondary education, uh, it, 
there was no there was no option but college and mm -hmm. uh, my my great passion from from the time i was in fifth grade um was music i started playing in our band in fifth grade and yeah it all comes full circle for me right i did not know that <laughs> what'd you play uh, yeah, i was a uh, saxophone i was a music education major Nobody in college plays saxophone. wow yeah. that's cool um, it's sexy the, yeah the way um the way our school was was very tiny school i graduated with about uh, i think 89 of us graduated together um, much bigger than than my friend who graduated from the town over victor he graduated with seven people <laughs> Um, oh, wow. Yeah, they play eight-man football, which is a unique thing in Montana. Um, apparently, they're starting to do eight-man football in Arkansas, but that's totally off the subject. Um, uh, okay. So... Uh, uh, you want to be a chef? Yeah. You know, I think, that, you know, my mom grew up cooking for us and... and uh, family meals were were important for us and you know as we got older things changed my sister um was a a very talented uh, ballerina and she danced probably oh gosh i think she danced almost five days a week in missoula which was about a 35 40 minute drive depending so as i got a little older that became a little less and less frequent just because my mom had to drive her uh, up there so i was again a vegetarian uh oh, you'd gone back to life. being a vegetarian yeah my, my last two years of high school uh, i was a vegetarian you're which, an enormous vegetarian how tall are you uh i am just six foot oh yeah. you look bigger than that yeah well it's the beard um <laughs> <laughs> but she uh you know she she cooked so much for us and um my sister is kind of a vegetarian still um but she um she just kind of instilled in us a, a, a real appreciation for actually cooking and you know um amy likes to play this game still i i had no uh my dad read a book that was written in the late 60s called the sugar blues and it was essentially this prophetic book that this guy believed that that refined sugars and corn syrup were going to be lead to um, all these health problems and obesity and addiction to sugars and all these things. Turns out he was right. Yeah, right. Oh, on, yeah. Brother. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in the in the 70s and early 80s. That was very progressive. Man, that was uh, that was like the time of like Count Chocula and all that stuff. And I, <laughs> uh, I never had sugar cereals when I grew up. I'd go to friends' houses and they'd they'd have like regular cereal and just spoon it on sugar. And I just, I just never understood it. I never really had that, that taste for it. So Amy, my wife likes to play this game when we're at the store every few months, we, we like to spread it out cause it's, it's going to not be as much fun when it's gone. But, uh, I had fruity pebbles for the first time at 38 years old, <laughs> <laughs> which is a, a total enigma. In, Captain in, Crunch. <laughs> uh, I've had Captain Crunch. It cuts your mouth. That's weird. I like it. Yeah, it's it extremely gritty. Yeah, yeah it, it, like, it kind of cuts the roof of your mouth. It's it's yeah. interesting. So how'd you pick uh, Texas, like Cordon Bleu? Uh, well, when, when I met Amy, I was working at a restaurant. I'd, I'd worked there about seven years. What called state? The, uh, in Montana. Okay. She was uh, a dancer, a uh, modern dance major at the University of Montana. Was when she we a met. friend of your sister? No, she was a, a good friend of one of my best friends in the world, Avril, and that's how we met. Um, thanks, Avril. Avril it. Levine? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, so uh, we uh, we met there, and we were dating, and I had a bunch of friends over and made a pretty nice dinner. And she was like, "Why are you Why are you waiting tables? Why don't you Why don't you cook?" And you know, I I've done two years as a music uh, education major, and it kind of kind of took the love out of it for me. I still love music. I still love playing music, but it wasn't because of my relationship with my band director, who was my band director from fifth grade until the time I graduated, I thought that that was what I was going to do. And it just turned out it wasn't for me. And, and I said, Oh, you know, I'd probably like to go to culinary school, kind of get a jump, jump start on knowing how to work in the kitchen. And I'd been in restaurants since, um, 
really 1998, I started working when I was still in school uh, at this place called The Shack as a dishwasher mm -hmm. and uh, hated washing dishes. So I, I said, oh, yeah, I've, I've bust tables before, which was not just a out and out lie. And I, I think my manager, Janet, knew it, but she gave me a chance and it all worked out for the best. But Amy said, you know, you should go to culinary school then if that's what you want to do. So uh, one night we were having dinner and I put a list of seven cities in front of her, each with a culinary school I was interested in. In. And uh, I really actually had my eyes on Austin, Texas, and she didn't hesitate and said, oh, well, let's move to Austin. So uh, about a year after that conversation, we packed up all our stuff and Amy's, Amy's dad drove straight through the night from Arkansas to Montana with his truck and hooked up our trailer and turned right around and got on the road to Texas. Wow. Yeah. That he's, was before the amazing. internet. That yeah. That was before the internet. Yeah, we were talking about that. Uh, you know, we had, we still have them. They're kind of commemorative at this point, but we each had a, a road atlas in our car. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, I mean, this was, you know, I would say when we moved, it, MapQuest wasn't really even a thing. You know, right. And you had a research. Yeah, he just, you track your thing and you stay. Follow the city signs. Oh, yeah. We passed here, passed yeah. here. And then you get screwed up on a business loop. You're like, why am I downtown? Because yeah. it says B. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got to go around. <laughs> yeah. So this is a great place to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Chef Matt Bell, owner-operator of South on Main Restaurant in Little Rock, Arkansas. We'll dig in. Hear that pun? We'll dig in to what it's like to open and run an eating establishment, some of the chef's favorite menu items and cooking preferences, how having celebrity in-laws Ted Danson and Mary Steen Bergen has played into his business model, and last about his partnership with Oxford American Magazine and their performing arts stage in his restaurant. We'll be back after the break. Flagandbanner.com is so much more than a flag store. Dress up your address, plan a perfect party, or throw some pillows on your porch. Bring in your old U.S. flag and get $5 off a new one. Hurry down to theflagandbanner.com. Downtown Little Rock, open Monday through Saturday. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of flagandbanner.com. Over 40 years ago, with only $400, Carrie founded Arkansas Flag and Banner. During the last four decades, the business has grown and changed, starting with door-to-door -door sales, then telemarketing, to mail order and catalog sales. And now, a third of their sales come via the internet. This past year, Flag & Banner added another internet feature, live chatting. Over time, Carrie's business and leadership knowledge grew. As early as 2004, she began sharing this knowledge on her weekly blog. And in 2009, she founded a nonprofit Friends of Dreamland Ballroom. And in 2014, Brave Magazine was launched. Today, she's branched out to the radio with this very production, podcast, and live stream on Facebook. Each week on this show, you'll hear candid conversations between her and her guests about real-world experiences on a variety of businesses and topics that we hope you'll find interesting and inspiring. If you'd like to ask Carrie a question, share your story, or underwrite any of our past or present shows, send an email to questions at upyourbusiness.org or message her on flagandbanners.com Facebook page. Back to you, Carrie. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with Chef Matt Bell, owner-operator of the sophisticated yet unpretentious bistro called South on Main Restaurant on none other than South on Main Street in Little Rock, Arkansas. Before the break, we talked about him growing up in Montana, falling in love with a dancer student while he was taking saxophone, while he was going to college for a saxophone music teacher, and realized and his then girlfriend now his wife realized saw your talent for cooking and y'all decided to move to, from montana to austin texas mm -hmm. to start going to the le cordon bleu uh culinary school yeah and um that's where we are now so you've moved to texas mm -hmm. and it was a how long was the, how long uh we were there just a little over a year did you get married while you were down there no okay no and you knew you'd made the right decision. Uh, about Amy, for sure. I was still <laughs> still unsure about the culinary thing. But really? Yeah. No, it, it was um, uh, actually for me because I was, uh, I think when we went, I was 24. Um, I had 
I think a much better experience in culinary school than a lot of people. Uh, a lot of those kids were, you know, 18, 19, just out of high school. Uh, it was kind of maybe a stop gap from going to an actual college. They didn't really know what they wanted to do. I, I graduated with, I think between our two classes, our AM and our PM class, we graduated with roughly, uh, I think about 45 students in that block. And, um, I could probably name about seven of them that are probably still cooking. Would you recommend that path that you took to somebody else if they wanted to be if they wanted to be a chef or own a restaurant? Would you recommend going to that school and doing it that way? Well, that school, those uh, Le Cordon Bleu does not exist in North America anymore, oh. um, and, and a little bit because of of that reason. Um, I I went in it with a. I went into it with a pre pretty reasonable expectation of what would happen when I'd get out, which is you start at the bottom. And I think that a lot of a lot of kids, because of Food Network and Cooking Channel and Top Chef and Master Chef Junior and all these things, there's a real romanticized idea of what's going to happen when you come out of culinary school. You're going to you're going to be the boss and you're going to be making incredible money and incredible mm -hmm. food. And it's going to be this really just like awesome, like work hard, party hard kind of thing. Get and on TV. Uh, yeah. And, and, um, you know, uh, and I think a lot of chefs, um, in, in, uh, high and influential positions are, are guilty of promoting that maybe not purposely, but you know, everybody wants to be Anthony Bourdain. Everybody wants to be Sean Brock and, um, and there's just not, uh, enough of those jobs out there, but there are plenty of jobs for people that want to cook, people that are disciplined and skilled. So uh, actually, uh, there was so a you would or wouldn't of, recommend it. Well, it's a complicated thing mm -hmm. uh, for me. I think it was great, and and I would recommend it if people have the same uh, mindset and understanding. But also, I'd worked in a restaurant for seven years. Mm -hmm. I knew I knew what I was getting into. Um, there was a class action lawsuit against Le Cordon Bleu. Uh, basically saying that uh, for uh, it was against for-profit colleges, basically, mm -hmm. which are, you know, uh, uh, they are problematic. A lot of online colleges, you know, mm -hmm. you're really not getting the degree you think you're getting. But, mm -hmm. you know, the chefs I had were pretty honest. You're going to come out of there and you're going to make just over minimum wage and you're going to be working in the back. And you're going to have to earn your stripes. Stuff. Ground and level, yeah. 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 Ground uh, level, yeah. Um, um where was your first job? Oh, mine? Mm -hmm. Ever? Mm -hmm. After you came out of there, where was your first job? Oh, out of culinary school? Mm -hmm. uh, Restaurant Capeo in North Little Rock. So you left Texas. Mm -hmm. And you came. There's, a, there's so many students coming out of culinary school in Texas. The the three jobs I wanted, which were um, Uchi was the first job I wanted, which is this incredible sushi restaurant. Oh. Um, and then there was a place called Zoot and a place called Wink. Those were my top three choices. Were they in Austin? They were all in Austin. Um, and I got uh, offers from all of them. And it was 12 weeks of an unpaid internship. And uh, that just didn't work for me. Uh, you know, that can work for a young kid whose parents are maybe still supporting them, but that uh, that was not the situation I was in. And and Amy and I couldn't support ourselves on one salary. And you can't you can't take an internship, work twelve hours a day, and then have a job. So was she dancing for money back then? I mean, not like dancing for money, but you know what I mean? Was she practicing her art? No, no. <laughs> That's funny. No, enough. Amy has a, a bachelor's degree uh, in modern dance and has, uh, since we moved to Arkansas, uh, worked in or adjacent to politics. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so you've moved, so you decided to move back to Arkansas because your uh, jobs, the jobs were picked. Slim. Well, you know, Nancy, Nancy's pretty, Nancy's pretty shrewd. That's uh, Amy's that's mother. That's my mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. She... You know, the, the job offers I was getting were not at places I really wanted to work. I dined at Capeo. I was very impressed with them and, and what they were doing. That's the and, Italian restaurant in North Little Rock. Mm -hmm. And so Nancy said, oh, you know, I was down there eating and they said they'd love to hire you. Mm -hmm. So I called and uh, did a little phone interview with uh, Eric Isaac and Brian Isaac. And they said, yeah, come on down, kid. Um, and it was it was actually a, a fantastic place to work. How long did you work there? Um, almost two years. I helped them open up our Genesee food. And then um, 
a guy named a couple named Patty and Gary Davis, who at the time were um, the private dining directors at the Capitol Hotel, dined at Capeo a lot and our Geno Seafood a lot. And I got to know them and they invited me out for dinner one night and said, just, you know, I know, I know you, you don't want to leave our Genesee food. I know, I know you love the, the Isaac brothers, but just, just come have dinner. And, uh, I had a really incredible dinner. The, uh, Lee Richardson was the executive, but the chef at the time in, in Ashley's was uh, a really good friend of mine now named Casty Dabney, who just, uh, yesterday got, uh, shortlisted for the James Beard nomination, the James Beard awards. She runs, um, the barn at Blackberry farm in Tennessee, which is probably one of the premier food destinations in the well, country. Congratulations. Shout out to her. Congratulations. Yes. She's on the short list. That's good. Uh, and I love her. She's uh, She was an incredible teacher. So she talked you into coming to the Capitol Hotel. Uh, I had that meal and at midnight I applied for a job online and uh, about a week later I had an interview and then I did a stage, which is a working interview and, uh, had a really awkward face to face interview with mm -hmm. Cassidy. Um, like I said, my dad died when I was young. So I actually do really well in, in women led situations. That's just kind of my comfort zone, having a, having a single mom and having a younger sister, like that's, that's where I'm comfortable. That's not everybody, but that's like good for me. And I, I asked her, like, you know, how is it in the industry for a female chef? Like, how is it? And she thought I was <clears throat> um, messing with her, to, mm. to put it nicely. And uh, <laughs> we, we got it worked out, and she hired me. <laughs> so I started uh, after my background check started a couple weeks after so that. So you started as a sous chef? Mm. I was actually hired at the Capitol Hotel as a pastry plater was my title. Pastry plater? Yes. Talk about starting at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, yeah, I didn't even actually get to make the pastries. You just uh, put them on the plate. Pretty much, yeah. And then you moved up and moved up. Well, you know, you you can you can be a pastry plater and you can continue to be a pastry plater, or you can get everything you can possibly get done in the shortest amount of time as possible, and then start asking every other chef what you can do for them. And uh, Casty appreciated that, and and I think that uh, in any restaurant, I think any job, you have to do that to mm -hmm. to really uh, set yourself apart. And mm -hmm. I was trying to put myself on the level of Cassidy and Matt McClure. Uh, uh, up at 21C in Bentonville, also got a James Beard nomination yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, great friend, great mentor. Um, you know, both of those people were incredible to work with. His executive sous chef at the time was working at the Capitol Hotel, Micah Klasky, uh, who is one of my best friends in the world. And he, uh, I'm quite sure, hated me for at least two weeks before. <laughs> He was, he was worried I was going to take his job. Um, and you should be. You should always be worried about that, I think. Uh, so, so you worked there for four or five years. Five, and I think years. one of the chefs kind of quit or retired and you got to in, you got to move up to head chef maybe? Well, I, I was I right? uh, my last two years there. I was the I went from pastry plater to roundsman pretty quickly. Roundsman means you yeah, work whoever's uh, station is off that day. So you work a different station every day. So you don't have the advantage of like settling in and knowing your prep every day and being able to do it. It's probably the hardest position in kitchens. Um, and Micah Klasky was doing that who was um who's incredibly talented and like i said just a, a great friend of mine and then uh, my last two years there uh micah was promoted to a, our banquet chef and i was promoted to sous chef of ashley's r.i.p ashley's it's 111 now so I, take I like to pretend that when i left they had to change the name that's so not true, but I can, I, can, I, can pretend. I can pretend. All right, this is a great place to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Chef Matt Bell, owner-operator of South Old Main Restaurant in Little Rock, Arkansas. We'll talk about how he started his restaurant, how it came to be. We'll talk about moving there. Then we'll talk about his partnership with Oxford American Magazine and who he has on the performing arts stage coming up uh, in the next segment. And uh, that, that stage is right in the middle of his restaurant. Uh, we'll be back right after the break. Flagandbanner.com is so much more than a flag store. Dress up your address, plan a perfect party, or throw some pillows on your porch. Bring in your old U.S. flag and get $5 off a new one. Hurry down to theflagandbanner.com. Downtown Little Rock, open Monday through Saturday. Flag and Banner is proud to underwrite Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. 
This weekly radio show and podcast offers listeners firsthand insight in starting and running a business, the ups and downs of risk-taking, and the commonalities of successful people shared in a conversational interview with Carrie. Along with this radio show, FlagandBanner.com publishes a free biannual magazine called Brave. First published in October 2014, this magazine celebrates and inspires readers through its human interest in storytelling. The Department of Arkansas Heritage recognized Brave Magazine's documentation of American life and microfishes all editions for the Arkansas State Archives. Free subscription and advertising opportunities for the upcoming Spring 2019 edition are available at flagandbanner.com by selecting Magazine, where you can read previous stories and learn about advertising opportunities. Back to you, Carrie. Uh, thank you. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with Chef Matt Bell, owner-operator of the sophisticated yet unpretentious bistro called South on Main in downtown Little Rock, Arkansas. At the break, he was talking about, I said to him, uh, I said to him something about how everybody that comes on here, there's no, it's not rocket science. They're all just hardworking, uh, and he is exactly that. He worked his way up through the ranks, uh, and he said, what was the name of that book you said everybody should read? Setting the Table? Yeah, Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. He's a restaurateur in New York. Um, chefs know a lot of his great restaurants, like 11 Madison Park and um, Union Square Cafe. And and you said he's more, the book is more about hiring people with... The, the book is, a, uh, it, it's a book about business. Um, the setting the table is um, the art of hospitality and business is what it's called. Um, and, and, and it's better to hire someone with a good heart, with heart and good work ethics than to hire somebody with that you can teach skills. To. Yeah. He talks about 51 percenters, people that are, are more, more coachable, more adaptable and less skilled. Like you can, you can hire anyone and teach them skills, but um, those people that, that want it and want to work hard and want to stay late and, and go beyond their, their maybe, you know, defined job description, those, those people will find success, whatever they do. Yeah. I mean, if, if I think if you have a great chef, you could, you could take him and and give him a musical instrument and he's going to apply those same uh, work ethic, worth at work ethic, and and be a phenomenal musician. He's going to be a success at whatever he or tries. Or a painter, or you know, really what a, a, a stockbroker. Like I just, I just feel like those people that have that in any industry um, succeed. Yeah, I, and you know, f- friends of example are are tr- uh, Charles Blake and Antoine Phillips, who are doing the Rock the Pul- Culture podcast. Uh, I'm convinced. You know, you've got a legislator and a lawyer. I'm convinced if you put anything in front of them, they're going to succeed because mm-hmm. they're those types. So of you're people. working at the restaurant. You've decided mm-hmm. you're going to open up South on Main. How did that come about? Did Amy do it again? She said. She said, <laughs> Matt, why don't you open up your own restaurant? Uh, I was. Um, I, I, I'd been promoted to to sous chef. Uh, Lee Richardson had left Ashley's. Um, I was the uh, only kind of executive level chef there in Ashley's at the time, and um, I was I was sure that I wasn't going to get offered the um, executive chef position, which um, I, I hold no animosity for. It wasn't mm-hmm. it for me at that place. It wasn't the right time, um, and. Uh, I had started looking um, at other cities. We were, we were considering a move to Nashville. I was offered a really great job uh, by a chef over there, uh, Tyson. And he, um, I'm sorry, not Tyson, but anyway, uh, I Viking, got offered a job Viking. over there. Mm-hmm. No, uh, it was at the Capitol, um, the Hermitage Hotel, Capitol Grill. Um, and uh, Cole Ellis, I almost said Tyson Cole, he was the Uchi chef. Cole Ellis uh, was there who has Delta Meat Market now in Cleveland, Mississippi, which is super cool. You guys should check him out. Um, uh, so that was something I was really considering. And, and Nancy, mother-in-law said, no, 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 oh, no, gosh, no. We would have never told her until we were packed out. <laughs> <laughs> um, bye. <laughs> uh, got the telegram, yeah. mother-in-law. I'm yeah. we're leaving. Okay, so, so we we were looking at that, and um, uh, shortly before that, uh, I was offered, or shortly after that, I was offered a position uh, at the 
yet to open SLS Hotel in Miami, which is a mm. uh, it's a chain of hotels that work with uh, Think Food Group, which is Jose Andres's food group. And uh, uh, I did a phone interview with them and was thinking, man, like getting to work with Jose Andres, um, one of my, one of my chefs I had worked with who had, who had, I think really facilitated my promotion and, and my growth there at the Capitol hotel, a guy named David Thomas, not Wendy's. I hate it when <laughs> I have to explain that, but he, um, he had taken a job with the SLS. He was getting ready to move down there. He offered me this position, um, Everything about it was an absolute dream, especially getting to continue to work with David and uh, my best friend Christopher was moving down there to, to work there as well. Um, and I just didn't love the idea of Miami. And right, it, and this is just a matter of a couple of weeks, all this happens. Um, uh, Warwick Saban had reached out and said that they were uh, interested in hiring me as a chef for a restaurant they were going to open because they had just moved down here on Main Street. And Warwick Saban was at that time the publisher of Oxford American Magazine. Yes. And and to, to my understanding, uh, I was going to be an Oxford American employee and get to make food. And that, that sounded much better than opening my own restaurant. Uh, but after after we talked, we you know, I quickly realized and I and I passed on the job in Nashville and I still uh, still kind of regret passing on the job in Miami. Never want to live in Miami, but uh, man, you don't incredible, really. incredible, incredible restaurant down there. Amy and I uh, went down there re- uh, about two years ago. Amazing. And I have lots of friends that are from Little Rock that ended up moving down there and have now gone on great companies in the position, but I just, uh, it just didn't feel right. And yeah, so you gotta go, you gotta go with your guts. Yeah, so we quickly found out that we were going to be opening the restaurants and then that's kind of, so you and Mort worked out a deal and somehow you ended up being the owner of the restaurant. <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought, I thought we kind of had a deal that I was working for them, but, uh, I realized that, you know, and, and he was upfront that they didn't want to own and run a restaurant. So what, what we have now and, and what we started with was what I call an intellectual partnership between, between the brands. So we host all of the, um, stage events for Oxford American. That's where we get the page to the stage. And, um, so that right now is usually one show a month on their series. Sometimes they'll add um, an extra show or two onto the series, but they do 12 shows a year. And then uh, initially they started with local live and um, I, I've got to give credit at, to, to Ryan Harris yes, with Oxford did. American Man, Magazine. Man, he's done a good um, job. You know, I think Warwick left Oxford American uh, either right the day before we opened or just in the first week that we opened. So, um, Ryan has been with Oxford since then and has been a really great partner to work with and a really brings in some great talent. And yeah. And he's a very, uh, uh, reasonable and measured person. Yeah, he is. <laughs> Might not get high highs and low lows with him, but he really, uh, as far as their programming, keeps everything really tight. And Which on is track. what you need. Absolutely. But it's interesting to me because I'm a business person and I go into your restaurant and I look right in the center of the floor and there is a stage mm-hmm. which could be tables, which could be turning a profit. How oh, did they? There'd look. be way too many tables for our kitchen size. <laughs> is that what? Is that true? <laughs> Absolutely, I don't want any more tables. Because <laughs> see, yeah, the first thing I thought enough. is, there's dollars, there's dollars, there's dollars. People aren't sitting there. Yeah, but there's dollars there, and people watching music too. So, do you, when they have an event, mm-hmm. when Oxford American has an event, uh, who pays the band? Oxford American. Yeah, yeah. So we we essentially are just the host venue for the night. So they sell the tickets. They sell the tickets. They bring the artist in. They run that entire side of it. And originally, you know, kind of based on what what Warwick had said, um, they were going to do all of the musical programming. And our initial agreement, um, our first year of operation, was we were actually not. Uh, not that they wouldn't have let us, not that Ryan wouldn't have let us, but we weren't allowed to to book music, um, and that was quite fine with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as as Oxford evolved and and the restaurant evolved, we started booking um, some of our own music. Um, it started with Local Live originally. You remember Local mm-hmm. Live? Oh yeah, I love yeah. it. Um, and then um, when they 
uh, we're not going to continue local live. We started what we call sessions, which is what we have now. So every month we pick a different host for sessions. And is that the concert series? Is that what sessions that's is called? That's our Wednesday concert series. That's your actual? Yeah, their concert series is Oxford American. Oh, so, so you do have two. You have two. Yeah. You have yours now and theirs. Yeah, and uh, so anything that isn't an Oxford American event is is music that we have booked now at this you, point. You can go to South on Main's um uh, website, yeah. your website, and, and click on everything. Yes, yeah. and click on events. Yep. And or calendar, calendar I think calendar. it is. Yeah. yeah. Click on calendar, and there it all is. What's the backstage? Um, if you click on on your website, if you click on. I think that was supposed to be my blog that I've never, never <laughs> written. <laughs> It it's was, hard to write a blog, isn't well, it, when all you, the time? Well, and also when you develop a website, you want to make sure you get something on there that you might need later. That uh, mm -hmm. you, you can reference back to. Yeah, well, that we can use if we ever need. So that was just for, you know, um, if artists wanted to share stuff or we wanted to share recipes. So you not only part... Yeah. Facebook is the best outlet for that anyway right now. So, so. go to Ox, so go to um, southonmain.com south and mm -hmm. click on the calendar and you mm -hmm. can see and you can sign up for the concert series or you can just see who's coming. Yeah, yeah. So the Is concert, it sell out at usually? Uh, the Oxford American Concert mm -hmm. Series? Yes. It's um, their, their 12 show series that they announce every year. Um, it sells out um, almost immediately and most people have because they want their seat and their server and that all all the things to be the same, they buy the actual all the the twelve show package. package. Yep, That's which, the which I thing. really recommend. And uh, we do, you know, we do have some disappointed people because they can't always uh, get into a show or get into the twelve concert series but that's that's a great thing you need and to make your reservations early uh, you need to buy those tickets early and so the, the oxford american concert series is is through oxford american and and they do their ticketing through uh metrotix.com and mm -hmm. then all of our events are in partnership with central arkansas tickets so you 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 not only had a uh, partnership with uh oxford american mm -hmm. but you also partnered with let me tell everybody that your wife's aunt is Mary Steenburgen, mm -hmm. who I don't know if you know this. I went to high school with her. I've heard that. <laughs> She's my drill team major. Dog, dog town for life. Dog town for life. So uh, I think it sounds romantic when uh, movie stars want to own restaurants, and they do a lot. Did they partner with you on that? They did, yes. And didn't yes. they give you a shout out on Jimmy Fallon's show? They did. They did. They always uh, take great care of us when they, when they have an opportunity to mention it. And, you know... Um, a lot of those media things, they they put out everything they want to talk about, and then whoever the host is gets to pick those few things. So it was very cool that he picked picked that to to key in on. And um, you oh, know. so that's how they do that. So Jimmy Fallon sends out a list of things he wants to talk about, and no, then they get to pick what it is. No, usually, uh, uh, like, and 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 my same experience with with local television. They say, "Can you send us what you want to talk about?" So you send everything you might think you want to talk about, and then they'll narrow down what they want to what they want to hear about. You also do uh, cooking on uh, TV. I've been on a segment with you before. I was showing my flag and banner wares one. Oh yeah, yeah. One uh, one Wednesday or I'm what. the second and fourth Monday of uh, every month at uh, the River Market Studios with KTV, and. Uh, I just love all of them down there. Great studio. Um, Alicia Dover has just taken such great care of me since I've been doing that. And she started the show. I was on their very first show when they started Good Afternoon Arkansas. And uh, Ansley Watts filled in. Uh, Ansley Watson filled in for her when she was gone. And I just love love them both. They're they're so dear and so helpful to me. So how long? So what days do you do that on? First um, first Monday. Did you say first Monday, second Monday? When did you say you usually do it? Second and fourth Monday of every month. Oh, twice? That's yeah. a lot. Yeah, I go on twice a month with them. And so you try to cook seasonal foods? Yeah, we do. Uh, the segment's called What's for Dinner. And occasionally I'll forget and Shan's like, you sent me a dessert recipe. I'm like, oh, well, I'll do breakfast for dinner and then show this dessert. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so cooking uh, seasonally. You grew up, for everybody that's just tuning in, if you want to go back and listen to what Chef Matt Bell said earlier about growing up in Montana as a growing up in Montana on a what was the name of that farm you were on final uh, 
finishing on the finishing lot oh, of the, of the yeah. cattle farm. Uh, five, uh, 503 Homemakers Road was the actual uh, the actual farm, but uh, 503. Yeah. Okay. About three, I'm sorry. It was the address. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It sounds like a nonprofit. Uh, but it was anyway, a forty-five minute bus ride to school from there. So, if you want to go back and hear about his Montana life, it's really interesting and in how he was an off and on vegetarian, and how he looks like a mountain man, and grew up on this finishing farm, and now you're a chef in Little Rock, Arkansas, mm-hmm. and Been here so you. F- 15 years now. I'm, wow. I'm like a bona fide Southerner. You're a I think, real Southerner. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you meld all the, the places you've lived and the food and the way you've eaten into your menu now that you have? Well, I, th- I think I, I owe a lot of what I do to, to the people I've worked with. And, and those people happen to be Arkansas natives, Cassidy, Dabney again, and Matt McClure. Um, but Cassidy, especially, you know, she, is very deliberate in the story she tells with her food. And now she's in, in Wallen, Tennessee at Blackberry Farm, and there's there's different products and different produce, and she might be telling a different story, but she she lets the ingredients um, kind of lead her in how she's going to tell that story. And, so, And the ingredients come from the season? Uh, absolutely from the season and, and also the locale. Um, she gets stuff up there now that... She wasn't able to get here when we were in when Arkansas. Um, what is you it know, you love about they have, cooking? They have ramps and stuff. Uh, honestly, uh, you know, I think I think it's a caring thing. I think it's really uh, a way to show people that that you do want to nurture them and you do want to take care of them. And um, also, you know, for me, I think that. Yeah. Coming from a music background, you know, the first thing you learn is that jazz is the only true American form of music. You know, er- everything else kind of has roots um, in these other places, whether it's country or, or or other things. And, you know, Texas swing is essentially polka, you know, from Germany. It's it's mm-hmm. it's really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. How you, yeah, it's really interesting yeah. how you can trace those things. And, you know, jazz was this thing that came from all of these cultures and, and all of these kind of uh, uh, honestly, uh, oppressive things that that kind of push this this coal of musicians into this diamond that is jazz, and and when you ask um, it, it, if you were to go say to to Germany and say what it, what is American food, they're they're going to give you the burgers, they're going to say that, but then they're going to start naming things like fried chicken and mm-hmm. and, and greens, and you know there's a there's a unique thing about Southern food that, that is more American than any other food. In Montana, you don't grow up with a fat stack of bound recipes from your grandparents because, quite frankly, people have only lived there for a little over 150 years, you know, as far as, as Americans, you know. And so, you know, there's no there's no unique food story in Montana. We actually take kind of whatever's happening in Seattle. And surprisingly, most Montana cuisine has a very pan-Asian flair because mm. of the, the Asian influence in Seattle. Um, you see that translated into Montana. So I just, uh, what I love about Southern food is being able to tell that story of, of this place and that time. And, What's your and favorite then moving dish? forward. Something trotters? Uh, no, I honestly like I'm I, I just love the field peas, specifically crowder peas. They're my absolute favorite pea. Is that a new thing? Uh crowder pea? Is that a new thing for you to be in love with? Um does, does it move around what you're in love with? Not really. I mean field peas are field peas are a thing. Uh I love making fermented hot sauces. Um <laughs> but I really you know, I just I just think that it, it, it's so cool that in the South you will have a cookbook that has hundreds of years of family recipes. Mm-hmm. You just don't get that everywhere in the country. It's because people have been here longer. And, you know, I always, I, I, I you know, it's a, it's a hard thing for people to talk about. Um, but you know, those Southern foods that we love the most greens, mm-hmm. field peas, fried catfish, cornbread. fried chicken, cornbread. Those are actually all African foods. And we wouldn't have those and we wouldn't think of those as something that are ours. And granted, I think that that now they are Southern foods. We've changed them and adapted them to what we have here. But, you know, the real uncomfortable conversation is that that without this slave trade, uh, tomatoes would not be here in this country. Okra would not be here 
um, bene seeds, which are sesame seeds, um, rice. Uh, the only reason we cultivate these things and get to have these things is is because of that slave trade. So you kind of have to uh, you have to acknowledge that and and accept that and and realize that there is some really unique history to these Southern foods that people think of like, oh, well, that's my grandma's. Well, it's it's way further than your grandma. Yeah. And it's, it's just really interesting and a really um, unique story to look at Southern food that way. Well, I want to tell everybody that you've been listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and that I've been speaking today with Chef Matt Bell, owner-operator of the sophisticated yet unpretentious bistro called South on Main Restaurant on none other than South on Main Street in Little Rock, Arkansas. I didn't ever get to ask you how that name came about. Oh, you, well, you got a minute? Yeah. It's easy. I mean, a minute. That's all I got. All right. So Danny Meyer's book, he says that you should call things what they are. Uh, he had Union Square Cafe because it was on Union Square. He had 11 Madison Park because that was the address. He had... And he doesn't say name it an address, but the first restaurant he opened that wasn't exactly what it was, was a place called Blue Smoke Cafe. And it was a barbecue restaurant in New York. And it was one of the only restaurants that he's ever had that was a failure. Uh, he has Shake Shack now, that is his big national chain that he has taken. Um, and he just says, Call it what Don't it is. Don't be cute. Call it what it is. So, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, so my uh, my best friend, Christopher, he called me uh, driving one night. Well, he was actually drunk, and he was riding in the passenger seat. And he calls, and he says, I got it. I was like, you got what? He's like, I know what you're going to call it. I was like, okay. He's like, it's South on Main, man. And then he pretty much hung up. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> like, I was like, well, shoot, that is it. That, that is it. it. That's good. That's yeah. good. Thank you for coming on, Chef. I was going to give you a, a miniature Montana flag, but, but I hate to say this on the air, but we were out of little Montana flags. Can you believe you that? One of them. Oh, yeah, we always did. For some reason, there was a run on Montana flags and we were out. So instead, you're getting a chef apron and oh, a mitten. Oh, that's awesome. You're so big. I hope that mitten fits you. You may have to give it to uh, your yeah. beautiful bride. <laughs> or the plateau is our, our state seal, gold and silver for Montana. Uh -huh. uh, I'm uh, a homer. Yeah. <laughs> 14 you've, years. You've lost, it, tell our it? listeners how much weight you've lost. Uh, 80 pounds. And yeah. tell them how you did it. I just stopped eating like a jerk. Um, <laughs> I stopped eating dinner after work and started eating at a normal time. And that really Cause you got that work helped at, me. At midnight. Oh, yeah. yeah. And don't you don't eat dinner at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's not cool, people. I'd like no. to tell uh, all our listeners, I'd like to thank all our listeners for spending time with us. And uh, if they think this program has been about them, they are right. But it's also been for us. Thank you for letting us fulfill our destiny. Our hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of flagandbanner.com. If you miss any part of the show or want to learn more about UIYB, go to flagandbanner.com and click on Radio Show. Like us on Facebook or subscribe to her weekly podcast wherever you like to listen. All interviews are recorded and posted the following week with links to resources you heard discussed on today's show. Underwriting opportunities available upon request. Carrie's goal is to help you live the American dream.